I'm Josh Weintraub. I was an intern at Late Night with David Letterman in 1993, and then I worked at Late Show with David Letterman from 1996 to 2002 as a talent researcher and then segment producer. It's almost impossible to convey how much I loved Late Night. It was a show that I think shaped my sense of humor. The first thing I ever remember seeing Dave do was a remote where he was at an inventor's convention. One of the inventors that he spoke to was a guy who had invented a device that I think go inside a coffin and prevent somebody from being accidentally buried alive. When Dave was talking to him, the guy revealed that he himself had been accidentally buried alive multiple times. And I thought this was one of the weirdest and funniest things I'd ever seen. Told me to tell you that he was buried alive three times. And this, he, he got I can understand being buried alive once, you know, sure. Everybody's gonna make a mistake. Or even twice, you know, somebody's looking the other way, they close the lid. But uh, three times, how, how has it had, happened to him three times? Just to run a bad luck then. Just to run a bad luck. Early on in Late Night, he did a, a bit where Dave just drove around through a McDonald's drive-thru over and over again, and then he just started driving the people there crazy. Ever seen anybody killed in there at McDonald's? No. Like, has the shake machine ever gone nuts and killed a guy? There you go. Do you have a family? Yes, one son. Yeah? How old is he? He's four. What, what's his name? Herman. Herman? Herman McDonald. Herman McDonald? Yes, he was born in the restaurant. He was born in the yes. restaurant? They gave birth to him in the bathroom. No kidding. You mean they wouldn't even let you off to go home to have the baby? filet fish sandwich, please. <laughs> well, what kind of fish is this? Is this the East River trout? <laughs> All right, we'll see you. We'll see you. All right. You boys want some fish? Oh, no. filet fish you right, sure? Man. Here you go. Boys well, seem kind of dim-witted to me. <laughs> Then again, I'm the one who's circling McDonald's. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, and by no means a cow town, but I didn't have a lot of exposure to sort of semi-countercultural things that were happening in New York. And there were these kinds of people were booked on late night. It wasn't all big stars. Brother Theodore, and he would come in and sit down with Dave and just be ranting and angry about all kinds of things. With every failure, my reputation grows. One of these days, You'll see my picture on every postage stamp. One of these days, I'll funerize the world. Is, uh, is that a Banlon shirt? <laughs> As an intern on the show, you just do whatever odd jobs need to be done. I was uh, given an envelope and told to run an errand. I needed to go to a music store, pick something up, and bring it back before music rehearsal. I arrive at this music store and I hand the guy the envelope and he opens it up and he looks at it, it was a check. And then he takes out this giant guitar case and it's this absolutely beautiful acoustic guitar, the most beautiful acoustic guitar I'd ever seen. It looked like a, a work of art. So I was kind of running down the street, holding this giant guitar case, like a, you know, holding it like a baby and dodging cabs and people and trying not to bump into anybody and really trying to take care of this beautiful, pristine instrument. I get to the studio and I, I hand it off and I'm like, okay, at least I did that. Well, of course that night it turns out Pete Townsend from The Who was gonna be the musical guest. At the end of the performance, Pete Townsend does what Pete Townsend does. And he picks up this beautiful guitar that I've carried like a baby and he smashes into the amplifier. Let's do something for the world. Let's do something good for those kids, for charity, for everything. Let's do something really fun. Not infrequently, uh, staff members of the show would be used to perform in bits. One year, a bunch of us were rounded up to participate in a bit that was the running of the cabs. And that was another bit that I think was played over and over again long after I even left New York. And finally, our viewers in Spain will appreciate this. It's an event that's often seen here in New York City, the running of the cabs. Let's take a look at this. There they go. Wow. Sometimes we would do a bit called roll call or something and Dave would take out a list and kind of just check to make sure everybody was here. And I remember I had to be the page who always interrupts Dave. Hey, the guy who died in the audience five years ago, is he still here? <laughs> the uh, the uh, CBS page. Here, Dave, here, Dave. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. 
Hold it. I'm not finished. Uh, Rich, the CBS page who always interrupts me. Right here, Dave. Okay, good. <laughs> At the time, there was some kind of MTV show where they allowed fans uh, to meet their idols of some kind. And so I was cast in a bit to play a big fan who was getting to meet his idol. I'm standing right outside his dressing room. Thank you, MTV. This is, this is amazing. This is so cool. Here we go. Nice to see you. <laughs> you look so different in real life. You, you know, know, you know, so do you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, what's it like being married to Connie Chung? What do you mean? Connie Chung, your, your wife? I'm not Maury Povich. <laughs> Can I change my guy? Late 90s, early 2000s in New York, the Yankees were on a tear, winning a lot of championships. Some of the players just became kind of folk heroes, and one of them was a guy named Orlando El Duque Hernandez. We booked him to do a comedy bit where it was as if somebody had won a contest to get hit in the head by a pitch from El Duque. I was cast to be that person. Now, the actual hitting in the head was done with a dummy, but in order to set it up properly, I had to go stand in a brick wall while the actual El Duque threw a series of pitches very close to my head, terrifying me each time. He seemed to enjoy it more and more with each pitch. Let's go right out now, live to 53rd Street, and say hello to the contest winner from Staten Island, New York, Alec Friedman. Alec, where are you, buddy? There he is. Okay, boys, take it away. In the research office, not only did we research the guests, but we were sort of the information center. And this was pre-widespread internet, so information just wasn't Googleable. I'm not sure Google even existed really at the time. And one of the things that we were counted upon to do every year on that Thanksgiving show was to generate a list of different kinds of pies, uh, because Dave would do a bit where he would use an intuitive power to guess what kinds of pies his mom had baked for Thanksgiving that year. The researchers would gather together, pull out cookbooks, and just generate a very long list of pies that Dave could then work from. But I remember we would have a series of berry pies, and then Dave would always say, you know, huckleberry, raspberry, blueberry, halleberry. I'm now going to try to psychically divine the kind of pie, the flavor of pie. I'll put myself into a small, slight trance. Please, while I'm under, do not approach the desk. All right, I have it. The first pie, pumpkin. No pumpkin. Oh, come on, it is too! <laughs> Rhubarb, pecan, cherry, apple, peach, gooseberry, blueberry, sugar okay. cream, key lime, gumbo, raspberry, chocolate, mince, meat, coconut butterscotch pecan, chocolate chiffon pie with graham cracker crust. You've got it. Yeah! <laughs> One of the things that Dave's shows had kind of innovated was showing a guest in a very old clip of work, like an old commercial they had done or something they had done when they were first starting out that people hadn't seen. And in the pre-YouTube era, uh, that stuff wasn't widely seen. I remember one of the people that we found out had been a kid actor was Mike Myers. Somehow I ended up tracking down a clip of him from a Canadian sitcom called The King of Kensington. I feel as if we used it in almost every subsequent Mike Myers appearance for quite a while. Uh, and we actually added to it, we would find more clips of Mike and we would kind of build them into a sequence. Mike Myers in Canada as a kid. Ma's on to something big, Larry. She just cracked the great raffle caper. <laughs> Phony tickets, you should have heard the sales pitch. Only cooks talk like that. Hey, 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 are these fake? Shove off, fat boy. <laughs> Special delivery for John Lennon. I was a huge Michael J. Fox fan. I was always excited to get to research him and, and be involved with a, a segment he was doing. One time I somehow got a notion about some work he had done in Canada that wasn't well known, maybe for a, a local station or a small independent production company or something. And there was a clip and a moment in it where I think young Michael is either asking to be adopted by somebody or is expressing joy at having been adopted. Here we go, Michael J. Fox at the age of 15, acting. I'm so frightened. How are they treating That's you at the Peppermints? <laughs> oh, they're okay. Whoa. Well, this Peppermint has to go for another operation, and they might send me back to the home in Kelowna. You oh, wouldn't want to see Lord. that, would you? No way. Okay. How would you like to come and live here with me, Harley? Wow! <laughs> really neat. Could I? 
Oh, stop it now. <laughs> now Richard Simmons was a frequent guest on the show. Barbara Streisand, somebody that he was crazy about, had recently married James Brolin. One of the things that we did for the segment was we, we mocked up a photograph of their wedding photo, but put Richard in his face in as the bride. After the show, Richard had really gotten a kick out of it, so he asked if he could get a copy of the photo. I went and I got the picture and I brought it up to the dressing room and he said, what's your name? And I said, Josh. And then he said, has anybody told you they loved you today? And I said, uh, no. And he said, well, I love you. That doesn't happen at a lot of jobs. And I haven't really heard from him since. No. Barbara Streisand, uh, a woman that I know you dated for a long time, <laughs> is now married to uh, Mr. Uh, Ann Coates. I, I was, I was James there. Brolin. I know all about you it. You were not there. I was there. You were not there. I was... How could you have been there? There's some there sort I of am. court order. No. <laughs> It's a phony picture. So I was there. You were not there. That's the second time you have doubted me. <laughs> so when I was segment producing, uh, one of the guests I got to segment produce was Jimmy Kimmel. And I got a phone call at my desk. Jimmy was outside on 53rd Street where the audience was lined up, handing money, cash, to people in the audience. He had this idea that he was gonna give everybody in the audience a dollar or five dollars or something for giving him an impromptu standing ovation when he was introduced. And he thought it'd be really funny as a surprise to Dave. And I had to explain to him that Dave was not keen on surprises and please, please, please don't do this. It didn't happen on the air. The segment went great. Many, many years later, uh, when I interviewed for a job on Jimmy's show, Jimmy Kimmel Live, I reminded him that we had worked together and even years later, he remembered that I had ruined what he thought would have been a fantastic bit, but he hired me anyway. So when Kathy Lee Gifford was leaving the Regis and Kathy Lee show after many years, she came on our show as one of her last appearances, and I had an idea that as a sort of retirement gift that we should give her a jet ski. Dave presented her with the jet ski as a surprise on the air, and it was only later uh, that I learned that Kathy Lee wanted to keep the jet ski, and not only that, but she wanted the show to ship the jet ski to her vacation home in the Florida Keys, which cost the show many, many thousands of dollars. <laughs> One time I was in a viewer mail bit where I was portraying somebody who had written Dave a letter, and the joke in the letter was, is that your final answer? Which was the catchphrase from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which had been popular for a while. Letter number two, Dear Dave, uh, is that your final answer? This is from Casey Gish, Chestertown, Maryland. Well, this is pretty funny, Casey, way to go. Uh, you're, only about, you're only about 10 months late there with your little uh, millionaire joke. Is this your final answer? And uh, here, Casey, take a look now. This is a sneak preview of uh, Casey Gish's upcoming letters to the CBS mailbag. Watch. Dear Dave, where's the beef? Dear Dave, I've fallen and I can't get up. Dear Dave, show me the money. Dear Dave, I just realized it's 2030 and I haven't aged or changed my clothes in 30 years. What's happening to me? Dear Dave, I now see that I am doomed to watch passively as friends and lovers grow old and die, while I remain, cursed with eternal youth, praying for the sweet release of death which never comes. P.S. What's up? You have a gun, and you have to shoot either David Letterman or Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> you know what I would do, Walter? I would have to turn that gun on myself. No, I would have to shoot Jimmy because if I killed Dave, it would kill Jimmy.